So a Scott Derrickson horror movie starring Ethan Hawke. Worked before. The Black Phone. Now, The Black Phone is a Blumhouse produced horror movie, and I haven't talked a lot about Blumhouse movies on this channel, but I really do like what they put out. Most of the time, they put out some really interesting horror movies, some really creative ones that don't have the biggest budget, but they have such a unique premise, and they have directors that know how to shoot horror in that kind of really creepy, atmospheric way that I really do have a lot of fun with most of the movies that they make. And The Black Phone is no exception to that. It's directed by Scott Derrickson, who I recognized as the director from Sinister, and Sinister is probably the scariest horror movie that I've ever seen. Most horror movies usually don't creep me out or really get under my skin because at the end of the day it's just a movie, it's camera tricks and lighting and you know all the good things that make you feel creeped out in the movie but for me most horror movies don't linger after the fact. I'm usually not looking over my shoulder or have a little bit of anxiety going back home back to bed after seeing a horror movie and Sinister really did that for me. I heard it was really scary so I did not see it in theaters but then when it came on Netflix I was like okay I'm gonna sit down it's at noon it's broad daylight. If it creeps me out, at least it's not pitch darkness and at night, you know, I have the rest of the day to kind of get over it. But there's something about that movie and maybe I'll do a sinister video someday and really explain my thoughts on it. But that movie effectively got under my skin and watching it in broad daylight kind of made it worse because for the rest of the day I was just looking over my shoulder looking in the bushes to see if Mr. Boogie was out to get me. So when I heard Scott Derrickson was making another horror movie also with Ethan Hawke who partnered with him in Sinister, I was pretty excited and the trailers looked good so I finally saw it and yeah it's another good Scott Derrickson horror movie. But there are some qualifying factors here. This movie really isn't so much a horror movie as it is a thriller suspense movie. And even though there are horror tropes and horrific imagery that we see throughout the course of this movie, the actual plot line is about this kid, Finney, played by Mason Thames, and he does a great job in the movie. He acts his heart out. He's very convincing as this scared kid. And after a few neighborhood kids get kidnapped and go missing from the grabber, who's this really creepy dude in a black van, Finney gets kidnapped, and most of the movie is him trying to escape this nightmare scenario, all the while his sister and the cops are trying to figure out where he went and find clues and try to get him out in time. So if you go into this movie expecting it to be as scary and creepy and eerie as something like Sinister, that's not what you're gonna get here. What you actually get is something a little closer to the Buffalo Bill storyline from Signs of the Lambs, where you have this person that's captured and they need to escape and you have this ticking clock, you know that they're not gonna last long, eventually the kidnapper is gonna kill them and you don't want them to die so the race is on to see if either they can escape or somebody can come in and rescue them and that's pretty much the whole movie. But even so, the movie is very effective with what it sets out to do. This story is a cautionary tale. It's about stranger danger. You don't want your kids to be alone on the street because somebody might grab them. And the way they set up the grabber in this movie is also very effective because you don't see a lot of him early on. The beginning of the movie mostly just focuses around these seemingly random school-age kids and they're, you know, doing normal school things like sports and hanging around the schoolyard and kids getting picked on and, you know, all the normal school things. But then when you think everything's safe, all of a sudden one kid kind of goes on their own and the van pulls up and you see the balloons and you see creepy Ethan Hawke silhouette and it just fades out. You never actually see what happens to these kids. So it has this air of mystery that who is this grabber? Is it man or monster? Or what is it? And what does he do with the kids once he grabs them? And this happens a few times during the first act of this movie and it helps to heighten up the tension where eventually you just see kids playing in the street, not even alone, just in a group. And you're thinking, okay, which one of them is going to get grabbed next? Because I know something bad's going to happen, so which kid should I not get too attached to? And it's not until Finney the main kid gets kidnapped when we really see more of the grabber and how he operates and kind of what his tricks are and who he is and, you know, all that stuff gets revealed in time. And before I go any further, I should really talk about Ethan Hawke as the grabber. Because even after his mysterious first few appearances where he takes kids away, you never see Ethan Hawke's face in this movie. Actually, that's not true. There might be one scene towards the very end where you do see his full face, but they do a really clever thing with the grabber and his mask where he has different segments of the mask. There's like an upper part and then there's the bottom part where sometimes it's a smile, sometimes it's a frown, sometimes it's just 
blank and he changes it out depending on his mood and sometimes he'll just wear the bottom part and you see Ethan Hawke eyes and sometimes he'll just wear the top part and you see the Ethan Hawke mouth. And that's a really clever approach because for this character you want him to be scary and when you first see him he's got the full mask on He's pretty freaking scary, especially if you're a little kid, but you don't get a lot of performance out of that. And it's when some of the layers get taken away and you can see Ethan Hawke's eyes or his mouth and you can see the emotion and just the creepiness of it and the disturbed nature of this man come through in the performance all the while some of it is still obscured so you don't even have the full face to relate to. There's still that closed offness of either one half of the mask or the full mask on. And I really give the movie a lot of credit for this because it doesn't try to ever humanize the grabber. Even though he's clearly human, there's really nothing ethereal or magical or horrific or demonic. He's just a child predator that wants to kidnap and kill kids. But it seems like a lot of movies nowadays need relatable villains. You know, they want to bring some humanity into the villain so that we can relate to them and sympathize with them and there's that kind of moral ambiguity going on. Not really the case with this movie. The Grabber is just a straight up creep, horrible person, child murderer, and the movie doesn't try to even entertain the idea that there's anything redeeming about him. And I think the mask plays a big part in that because there's something about just seeing a person person's face completely, where we immediately try to look for something to empathize with, even if they're a terrible person. But the movie doesn't really give us that. He's always obscured in some way or another, so he feels less than human. He feels so detached. And the fact that the mask is a devil mask, you know, it's not the most subtle mask choice, but you know, it gets the point across. So full credit to the design and execution of this mask concept. It's very original. I haven't really seen that done, at least in that way in any other movies before, and I really appreciated that, but that doesn't detract from Ethan Hawke's performance. This is a really good performance of his. He's completely irredeemable, like I said, but he brings the horror and maliciousness and that unhinged psychopath energy. But there's also times when you can tell that he's frustrated and things aren't going to plan, and he's just so done with the whole thing. He's thinking about just scrapping the whole idea, and it's actually kind of funny to see a horror movie villain deal with these issues. Like imagine if Michael Myers had a voice and actually talked and got super frustrated every time Laurie escaped his clutches. That's kind of funny and when you see it in this movie, you laugh but at the same time you're waiting for the other shoe to drop when he just starts going after this kid. I guess the only thing that I can really compare this performance to is Heath Ledger's Joker. Heath Ledger's Joker was terrifying. He was an agent of chaos, you never knew what he was going to do next, and he was completely irrational. But at the same time, he did have a comedic sensibility. It was a very messed up sense of humor, but it was a sense of humor nonetheless. And Ethan Hawke kind of has that same energy throughout a lot of this movie. And it did help to kind of alleviate some of the very serious moments throughout this movie with a little bit of humor. And you laugh, but it's that really nervous laugh where you're like, haha, where you're laughing one second and things seem nice, but you know that he could be beating this kid half to death the next second, and that's not a fun time for anybody. But at the end of the day, it makes for a very memorable villain that you love to hate, but also just want to see more of because he's so entertaining in that really sick and twisted kind of way, which I guess says more about me than it does about the movie itself, but I don't know, I liked it. And I guess I should probably talk about the black phone itself since it is the title of the movie, and yes, there is a black old rotary phone, and that's another thing I liked about this movie. This is a period piece. It takes place in the 70s, which has that kind of nostalgic analog feel to it, and for some reason, horror really works in that era because people didn't have cell phones they didn't have the internet. It was a lot easier to be off the grid or be taken off the grid and people wouldn't know immediately. But the black phone is probably the biggest spoiler in the movie, so I'll keep it vague because I don't want to ruin it because the movie just came out recently, so if you haven't seen it yet, go see it. But the black phone is basically a device in this holding cell that Finney is in once he gets captured, where he's able to commune with, well, let's just say, help in order for him to escape or at the very least just stall long enough for the police or whoever's investigating to come in and rescue him at the end. So yeah, there's not much I can actually say about that without getting into spoilers, but I did really like the execution of the black phone in how it all worked together and how it culminated in a incredibly satisfying climax. A climax that I didn't really see coming. I wasn't really sure where they were going to go with it, but 
it was unexpected but at the same time made so much sense for what they set up previously that it just worked. It worked perfectly. It was an incredibly satisfying climax where everybody was making smart choices. Nobody had to just be an idiot for the sake of plot. And I really like that because so many movies just give main characters plot armor for the sake of continuity or plot or keeping them alive. But this movie actually had me guessing a few times as to who would survive or would he get rescued or would he have to escape. I didn't really know where the movie was going. But in the end, all the pieces were there from the beginning and it just comes together. And I guess the last thing I'll talk about is Finney's sister, and she's not really a main character. I would consider the main characters to be Finney and Ethan Hawke's The Grabber, but she actually plays a much more important role in the movie than I originally thought. It all has to do with her dreams, and I guess she has some kind of psychic ability where she dreams things and then they come true and it's really messing her up and she doesn't really know how it works and her dad's not a big fan of it and he's kind of abusive so there's this whole other like family drama in this movie that's executed very well, very relatable with really good actors making it work. And she's got kind of her own side quest going on where she's trying to piece together clues to find Finny. And at first I was kind of like, oh well this whole vision thing seems a little out there and it seems kind of like the Stephen King trope of just throwing in a psychic kid for no real reason but just because. But as the movie kept going this concept of her and her dreams kept winning me over because it had real world consequences in the story of this movie. It wasn't just there as this neat little gimmick. It had an effect on her family dynamic, it had an effect on the investigation, it had an effect on the police officers, and at the end of the day I thought it was a pretty cool addition to this already pretty original and fresh take on the kidnapping child predator genre of movies. I, I guess it's a genre now. You know, it's kind of weird to think about child predator and kidnapping movies, their own sub-genre within the greater horror movie genre, but I mean there's enough of them out now, I think it's safe to call it that. But anyway, those are my thoughts of The Black Phone. It had me on the edge of my seat for pretty much the entire runtime. It was a cool premise with a very clever execution. There was a lot of originality in this movie. It didn't just feel like a run-of-the-mill kind of Blumhouse horror movie. They had an interesting script, good direction. Scott Derrickson did it again with Ethan Hawke playing an incredible villain here. And I'd say give this one a watch, but now I turn it over to you guys. What do you think about The Black Phone? Have you seen it? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And as always, I'm Colby. This is my Nerdy Talk, and I'll see you in the next video.